from Sand Hill Road in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's the Q, presenting the People First Network. Insights from entrepreneurs and tech leaders. Hello everyone, I'm John Furrier with theCUBE. We are here in Sand Hill Road at Mayfield's office here, talking about entrepreneurship, people first. This is our co-created program with Mayfield. I'm John Furrier, your host. We have Mitchell Hashimoto, who's the co-founder and co-CTO of HashiCorp. Great to see you, good to CUBE alumni. You're back on theCUBE. Thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I was here so long ago, <laughs> like five or six years ago. So we've been really psyched about the program that Mayfield's put together called People First. It's celebrating their 50th anniversary as a venture capital firm, which is historic in the sense that it's kind of still a young industry to think about it. And love to have entrepreneurs come on because you've been very successful. We talked years ago, I think first year you were formed, and cloud certainly has happened. Yeah. Open source continues to pump more value, I mean, you get things out there coming out of Google, it's ridiculously amazing. The, the goodness in open source is certainly driving a lot of great software development. You're a big yes. part of that, so thanks for, for joining. So I got to ask you, you guys are growing right now. You have, you're venture backed, you got a unique culture. Explain HashiCorp, because you guys have a unique business. <coughs> you're in open source, you're in cloud, you have a distributed workforce. Give, take a minute to explain what you guys are doing. Yeah, so we are trying to build, you know, or have been building sort of infrastructure software of the future. Um, we've been saying that since we were founded and, and what's been interesting is the future has changed quite a bit in the past six years. So there's been cloud, that was the big thing when we founded and then containers and now schedulers and Kubernetes and things like that. Uh, and while we're doing that, we're also sort of building what I think is sort of the company of the future, which is um, over 90% of our workforce is fully distributed. Um, basically, unless there's legal reasons not to be distributed, we, uh, we are distributed. Uh, we're in multiple countries, we're in over 40 states. Uh, we, every, all of our process is built remote first, so everything happens. Slack, all our meetings are Zoom, um, even our all hands, you know, we present behind a camera and things like that. So I think that's all very unique, but only for now. I think How that's do you do the all common. hands? That's interesting. Do you have a camera to a Zoom, or is it a camera live streaming? How do you do the, to the all hands? Yeah, so we set up sort of an AV setup in our office because we have uh, a few of the executives in the office that often are presenting on the, on the all hands, and we set up a camera feed so that whether you actually decide to go into the office or whether you're at home, we want that experience to be authentic to both sides. We don't want you know, a great in-room experience and then one corner camera that makes it really hard to hear and stuff like that. So yeah, you have to walk up to the camera and be part of the Zoom to really be part of the all hands. So people feel present and mm -hmm. connected. Right, exactly. And we, we force questions to come through Slack. There's no in-person questions you have to ask on Slack so everyone could see them and things like that. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Talk about the journey as you started. You have a co-founder, you guys have an interesting relationship. How did this all get started? What was the beginning genesis of HashiCorp like? And take us through some of the early days. Sure, so I'm, I'm very lucky. I have a co-founder who, before the company, were best friends, and after the company, or during the company, were still best friends, <laughs> uh, which <laughs> isn't always the case. Uh, uh, but in terms of HashiCorp itself, we were super lucky because we went to the University of Washington up in Seattle, and this was in sort of the mid-2000s, and this is a good time to be up there because cloud was starting to emerge and we were sort of equidistant geographically across the lake, if you will, to Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And so we were getting early access to what they thought was sort of the cloud at the time and it was rapidly changing. We were getting access to servers with APIs um, and all this stuff and being a university uh, without a lot of funding, my job there was sort of to help us utilize all these resources. Yeah. And so in the mid 2000s, Armand and I were already realizing, we're on the same team, um, Armand and I were already realizing that this is a, not a solved problem by any means. I mean, this is a new problem. Um, and that eventually years later became the genesis. And of what was the that problem that you saw immediately? It was sort of like multi-cloud, uh, resource management, deployment, security. Uh, it's funny because it's, it's, you know, over 10 years yeah. later and it's, it is the problem that enterprises are hitting right now. I mean, think about the early days of Amazon. I just, I still have these memory flashbacks of EC2, long <laughs> URLs. It's like, okay, now how do I redirect my web service to this? Like, yeah. So it was easy to stand up an EC2 instance, put a little S3 to it, then it's like, okay, now what? Yeah, we're at the- a little right scale, I put this in there, what's kind of dead. So again, yeah. a little early, kind of build your own, kind of a junkyard, you build the you know, car out of some spare parts, yep. but then it had to mature really fast. And yeah, we're at the day zero yeah. stage then, and now we're firmly in like day two. And so what was the ne next step? As the, is you, Can you peg the journey for us? Because obviously it grew up really fast, and then mm -hmm. it really kind of hit a tipping point around 2010, yeah, 11, right. 12, 13, it kind of grew like a weed. Yep. 
Uh, yeah, so around that time frame, you just you just painted uh, 2012 is when enterprises started adopting it. Um, and I think a lot of that was single cloud focused. It was very much like, this is our first cloud, so we're going to land pure land Amazon or something um, and focus on that. And we're at the point now, about six years later, 20, 2018, where the, mat the maturity around operating the cloud is sort of well understood. And companies are now starting to sort of use what's best for the job and also realize that there's multiple clouds and we're keeping our private data centers. And also there's new things coming on the scene above clouds or higher level like Kubernetes yeah. um, and you know how we're gonna manage all this. And so uh, we like to describe it as sort of the mindset is like the cloud operating model. It's like you can't operate your resources in the cloud the same way you do on-prem. Um, and people are starting to get that. That's like automation, uh, very yeah. like people focused workflows, things like that, and, and companies are getting that. And so now the challenge is this, these heterogeneous environments. So the top conversation in our office, and everyone loves loves when I bring this. I want to get your um, definition and opinion. Okay. Is Kubernetes? Sure. Kubernetes is you know a lot of people love it. I've been having Kubernetes dreams these days because there's so much Kubernetes conversation <laughs> happening. You got Kubernetes. You got the notion of service meshes right around the corner. Uh -huh. Stateful applications. But that problem's really hard to work on. Stateless mm -hmm. has been around for a while. What's the importance of Kubernetes? What's the impact, in your opinion, expert opinion, what's, why is Kubernetes important, and what's the impact of Kubernetes? Yeah, I think, I think the more like, abstract thing that's important is the scheduler idea, and Kubernetes sort of builds on that, and really it's the idea of like, let's move away from looking at the individual machine, and let's start moving higher level to just assuming resources are there. It's sort of like when you write, the transition of when you were writing software from having to know how much memory you had to just, let's just assume it's infinite and put whatever in there and it's you know someone else's problem. And we're sort of moving into that in data center. It's like, let's just assume we always have compute and storage and network and let's just deploy. And what freedom does that give you? And I think that's really what schedulers uh, give you. And also, when you, when you sort of take away huge operability challenges of placing the application and, and giving that to a computer to put it in the right spot, you can now deploy so many more applications because... So you're freed up. You're freed up in a lot of ways. Um, it introduces a lot of new challenges, but that's a good problem. You want new challenges, you want to solve the old ones. What are some of the new challenges that you see emerging that kind of ev keep the evolution going? I, I think service mesh is a, is a great example we could jump into, which is that the challenge of, we like to describe service mesh as three fundamental problems, which is discoverability, configurability, and secure connectivity. If you have two services, that is not a problem because you could hard code the IPs, you could hard code the configuration, and you could just hard code TLS certificates to make yeah. it work. When you have thousands of services that are coming and going and people are trying new services all the time, yeah. that has to all be automated. So the idea of service mesh is automating that, making it invisible, automatic, free, um, and that's new, that's a new problem. And that's a huge concept. Huge. This is a scalable, scale out, huge concept and super important. Yes, yeah. This changes the game at many levels. When, what would you see that changing? What would some of the, for folks like who are just now understanding, what does it change downstream or down the road for enterprises and for businesses? I think the biggest change is a mind shift change from sort of perimeter or host-based security to identity and service-based security. So traditional sort of networking and security is very, IP space focus is like this, this rack, talk to this rack or no, and things like that. And that has to all go away because that's restricting the placement. That's, you know, that's not allowing apps to go anywhere. We have to move towards this service, could, can or can't talk to this service, don't care where it is or anything, um, and sort of move from a perimeter to just the perimeter being the app itself. Mm -hmm. So we have to sort of firewall and protect right at the app layer. And that's hard to transition. That that's tooling change, that's education change, that's team change. I want to ask you. I know I could talk about this forever. Cloud automation is, I think, one of the most important things. That's only going to make AI more powerful, and the data behind it, and this new yeah. data merges merges. But I got to ask you about some of the new um, blood coming into the marketplace because traditionally, if you think about service meshes, oh, it's just a software problem. We'll just solve it with software. But you actually got to have networking chops. You got to have to have a computer science or computer engineering. A new skill set's developing really fast in this new, I don't want to maybe call it under the hood, I don't know what to call it, but maybe it's an engineering mindset where people, there's a huge demand for skills in automating. Mm -hmm. It's not your classic application developer, there's this great role for that and there's tons of apps being built, but we talk about a, a new kind of operator. Yes. What's your take on this new skill, this new opportunity for people to learn and develop a career? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the, the real way to look at it, I, I like to look at it, is sort of the difference between creating sort of doing something once and creating a process to do something and there's sort of two different tasks right it's like when you get promoted for the first time from you know to manager it's like the big the
the big challenge is learning how to teach others process and enforcing consistent process versus actually you know doing it yourself like yeah. and i think that's the difference between someone who is used to just slinging uh, let's go like back to like even server automation someone who's used to just manually clicking or slinging bash scripts to do one off tasks you could be a wizard at that but then you know try to do that repeatedly safely 9000 times out of 9000 times and now that's that's a resiliency challenge that's sort of understanding failure modes it's yeah. it's very different um and i think that's the biggest skill set to adopt is i always sort of push anybody in their job to just what how do you not do your job? Like, how do you move on to the next problem? How do you eliminate your job? Yeah, basically. That's almost like the way to think what, about it. Yeah, what's the what's the process? Is it possible right now? And if it's not possible, what's sort of blocking that? So I want to ask you a question. I love love this. We'll move on to some of the, the business sides in a second, but I want to get your thoughts because the be I've been having conversations lately with cloud folks and engineers and developers around two words, replicating and reproducing. Okay. They're kind of two different concepts. Reproducing is doing the same thing over again. Uh -huh. You know, make that spaghetti sauce, do it again. But did I write it down? Is there a recipe? Or I could just hand you the recipe and say you make it yourself, or automating it. So I think, you know, replicating also has scale. Reproducing requires the same components. Do you see DevOps evolving to a point where do it once and it's replicated, or is there some reproduction involved, reproducing things? Where is that? Where do you see the tech happening? Uh, I think I think inevitably you're sort of doing both, but my my sort of dream world where I think it'll be still, but I think it's sooner than we expect, but I think sort of like 10 years from now is a safe sort of stage. It's sort of like every, it doesn't matter if you're a Fortune 500 or a new company, sort of the way infrastructure server management goes is you just start with one server. I like to call it the stem cell server. You just start with one server, you you know say what you want and you just let it go. And it's mm -hmm. going to either replicate or reproduce. It's either creating something new or it's like creating more copies of itself, uh, but it'll turn into any sort of you know scale Facebook level scale that you would want in theory, um, and I think that that's sort of my long you know fence post guiding fence post that I always think about the problem. Talk about the culture of your company. You guys have a new CEO. Mm -hmm. so you have a partner you've been best friends with. So I don't think it's that yeah. new. The CEO. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's been around for a while. Couple years. Couple yeah. years. So you've been a co-founder dynamic. Did you guys look at each other and say, hey, we got to bring a CEO in, some people like to have one of the founders be the CEO. Talk about that dynamic, because that's a struggle for a lot of entrepreneurs to have the self-awareness and or the need to do that. Yeah, so Armand and I made the decision to look for a CEO if possible, I think three and a half or four years ago. It took us almost two years to find Dave. Uh, and our motivation was really, there's a few things. One was something our investors told us, which is you know, long-term, you want to do for the company what like you want to give the company the biggest value you can and like what do you bring to the company and as at, for us as founders our skill set was product vision engineering um sort of industry strategy things like that and it wasn't executive management financing um, building you know various teams like sales marketing building out the corporate structure that wasn't us and so we looked at it and thought we could learn it probably um but we would make mistakes and it would be hard it's just not our passion it's not what we want to do um or we could try to find Someone who aligns with our culture and gets our vision, gets open source, things like that, um, bring them in and f sort of scale to a way where we're giving our startup the best chance it has, which means we, we give it the value we do, which is engineering and product vision. And the new person coming in gives it that sort of corporate maturity, and that's exactly what Dave did. That's awesome, and it's always hard to do that because you know you got to have real maturity to make that happen. So congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. You know, a lot of us uh, have that problem. <laughs> and then one of my startups like, oh, I need a new CEO. The ventures where guys were pushing it on you, but okay. it's a challenge. You know, you got to think about. You know, then we'd have a business model back then, but it's a different story. But um, that's always a tough one. Now let's talk about the um, culture around where you started from and where you are now, because a lot of the stories around entrepreneurship is team, culture, mm -hmm. you know, how you're going to set up your, your future of work, which you guys have a good structure. Iterating and figuring out where the, the tailwind is. Are you at the spot where you thought you'd be at a few years ago when we first met? How has it evolved? Were there a little bit of a zigs and zags you had to make? And what was that like? Can you share some of the journey uh, color commentary with us? Sure, I mean, as a as a company size, there's, we're nowhere near <laughs> where I thought we'd be. I, I think Armand and I came into it expecting failure most likely. And so anything beyond that was just surprise. So that's great. I think the place we are where we thought we'd be is sort of the company culture and stuff. And that's something we've been very fiercely uh, uh, protective of. And and we define our culture sort of as we publish it. Um, we call the principles of Hashicorp, which sort of revolve around kindness, honesty, humility, things like that. So it's who would we want to work with? And let's put words to it because we don't you know, want it to be this nebulous thing. 
And so we've, we've held to that really strongly. We're over 300 people now. And every something Armand says, which I totally agree with, is I come into work, come into work, I go, to, go <laughs> to my remote office. But I, I come into work, and I'm excited to work with everyone at HashiCorp, which is in past jobs we've had, we'd come into work, and we're excited to work with like two out of ten people. You know, it, it, and that that's not a good ratio to have. And I think that's what I'm most proud of from the culture side. Um, that the ways we've done that is like at the principles. We also have something called the Tau, which has been incredibly successful for us both internally and externally, which is how we view product development and design. And it, that helps sort of align the type of engineer who could get behind our vision and put some words to our vision. So it's not again nebulous, whatever the founders think. So they have expectations of what's going to be like mm -hmm. from a coding standpoint, contri contribution. Yeah, from how do you. I like to describe it as how do you build product and how do you, uh, you know, how do you handle people? We have the two sides totally published and we're pretty explicit about it. That's awesome. Talk about the um, the role of open source and lots of changing it's, and you're seeing a lot of um, pro, uh, things like the Linux Foundation, CNCF, massively commercialized. There's tons of money coming in there, mm -hmm. but Linux Foundation has done a good job of keeping that pretty pure. Um, Success on entrep uh, entrepreneurship and open source go hand in hand now. It's almost, you know, it's, it's really the perfect storm for creators. Yeah. But there's a playbook, there's a way that's changed. Share your vision of how you think open source is today and where it needs to maintain and what could be changed for the better. Yeah, I think, uh, so open source today is pretty much a default expected, uh, accepted sort of uh, pattern, um, which is really nice. It gives you community, so you could, you know, groundswell. Everyone, anyone could adopt your software without having to go through a salesperson or something like that, which is really important. Anyone can contribute and make their mark on the software. Um, it's a great way to sort of get careers started. Uh, I think it brings a level of transparency to software that is, you know, you could hide behind closed source. It's like we like to tell our customers, it's like if you don't believe us, not only try it, but go look at how it works, and you know, it works. We're telling you the truth, um, and I think that's really important. I think there's still a lot of challenges around uh, how do companies sort of build successful businesses around it. I mean, I think we're doing all right and, and things like that, but there's still low number of data points. Uh, you know, the, always the, the challenge is, and I'll get your reaction on this, is that as companies get involved, the classic reaction was, oh, we've got the big companies now in this open source project, it's going to be land grabbed, they're going to put their fingers in there, need better governance, yep. things fracture. Um, where ideally it's an upstream project where everyone contributes for the better good and then people pull it downstream. I mean, that's the basic ethos of open source. Yes. That's the main, that's the, that's the playbook that we want, right? And that's what, do you believe that's the ideal scenario? Uh, I, I think that, yeah, I think shared ownership is really important, but I also think that um, sort of unified vision is equally important. So you, th that's a healthy tension to me, which is that you have a huge community that wants to pull the project in different directions. And I think if you don't, if you have a governance that's totally fair, what ends up happening, in my opinion, is you end up getting camels instead of horses, right? Like you, you start pulling in all these different directions. You sort of need a slightly unfair governance model, so there is somebody that says, this is the direction we're going. Yeah. Um, and that person needs to be someone that's trusted by the community. And Linux was very successful with that too, I mean. You know, right, and yeah. I think Linux is an example of a project that like reaches a point where that's, the vision is obvious and yeah. clear, and it reaches a point where, you know, Linus kid step down for a bit and take a break, and it still runs fine. And it's yeah. it's, but it's a in the know, early days you need a benevolent dictator to say, look, yeah. we got to do this. Right, Linux yeah. is a 25, 30 year old project yeah. versus, uh, you know, some of these CNCF projects are two or three years old, and I think that's where you absolutely need strong leadership. Versus well, we'll see. We'll look at yeah. the contribution. We'll look at that. We obviously follow that pretty heavily. and yeah. appreciate the Kubernetes commentaries. We think that's super important too. Mm -hmm. Obviously, containers. That it's pretty much voted, it's open now. Yes, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. We know that. Okay, so I got to ask you the final question. Uh, as an entrepreneur, access to capital is super important. Um, how did you guys go about it? How did you raise money? How should people raise money today? Obviously, you're an entrepreneur in the ecosystem, you're out in the front lines building a company. Mm -hmm. How did you guys access the capital? How should people figure this out? Yeah, I mean, you just, you got to tell people why, you know, it's a marketing problem in a way, but you got to tell people why what you're working on matters because it's so obvious to you as a founder. That's that's easy. It's it's about how do you articulate that um, and, and tell people how it's, why it's important and not just to you, but to the market and how it's going to help people. Uh, and we did that. And, and I think our biggest challenge was we had to do that across six or seven products, which is we had a lot of pressure to like, why don't you just do one thing? But it was because for us, yeah. What was important was not just what the product did, but the greater vision behind why are we doing six things. Um, yeah. And and that we just, you know, you'd say that and you find people who believe it and they help you. 
And as you guys, a great example of uh, you're on a big wave with cloud and open source, how should entrepreneurs, and, and what do you guys do to do this? Maybe it's more of advice or, or anecdotal observation. As you have the dynamics with investors, advisors, service providers, how do you get the most out of them? And how do you manage that board dynamic? Because when you have an emerging market, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a danger of saying, we got to lock in a business model. Yep. You know, so in, in open source, obviously a little bit more freedom there because you're open source, but that's always a danger. And as an entrepreneur, you got to balance that, okay, let's, we got to move the needle, but let's not overdrive too hard. How, how yeah. should entrepreneurs handle the, and taking advantage of their investors and boards and how should they manage them or work with them? Yeah, I think, I think on one side, you need sort of it's like multiple pillars and on one pillar, you need a strong vision. So you need, what, what, what won't you sacrifice on? Sort of what's the fence pulls? fence post in the distance and maybe the journey there is slightly different but you know what you're sort of heading towards so that always grounds you i think the second thing is sort of a level of pragmatism like you need you need to have that vision but you need to meet your customers where they are and so you need to figure out what you need to give them today but still head towards that that vision and when you have those two things you have a board that is on you know on board with both of those things you have founders that are that are dedicated to that and you have employees as well and Every sort of, everything sort of moves in the right direction. You got to lay that out. You have to be pretty explicit about it, yeah. All right, well congratulations on all your success and uh, looking forward to following up and seeing you guys are doing. Thanks for coming in and sharing your thoughts today. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks. I'm John Furrier here at Mayfield for the 50th anniversary. It's part of our People First Network coverage. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. <laughs>